Good evening and welcome. My name is Vijay Mehta, Chair of United Countries. And I'm pleased to see so many dedicated peace and development activists, NGOs, youth and students, and your passion is the driving force behind all the social changes in our world. It is an honor to have distinguished speakers to take part in our session on peace campaign. We have John Henry, Director of War One, Jeremy Gailey, okay, uh, is there, founder of Peace Monday, Jane Bully, media lecturer and journalist, Wendy McKee, Ambassador of Rights and Humanity, and one more speaker we are missing is in the audience, Alan Bear. <coughs> no, probably he's not. Okay. Uh, let me say that we've got many successful campaigners in the audience. <coughs> and among them is my own daughter, Renu Mehta, founder of Fortune for Charity, whose campaign launch event attracted a worldwide audience of 1.3 billion people, including print and media companies. <laughs> the format of the evening is lectures followed, followed by country, there is about two or three contributions from the floor and then we have a question answer session. I know some of you have already given interviews to the camera crew, but some of you are having a campaign or doing some activities and you want to share with us, then the camera crew will be available after the event. <laughs> Allow me to say a few words about our organization Uniting for Peace. Among many famous names associated with our organization, Philip Noel Baker, who is the only person in history who have won both an Olympic medal and the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> our present president, Lord Vizaraja, and our vice president, Lord Frank Judd, have been former UK cabinet ministers. United for Peace is launching an exciting new campaign, 4D for World Peace. 4D is a holistic concept approach for uniting the four strands of disarmament, demilitarization, development, and democracy. Why we are working on these four strands? Because of the huge threats and challenges we are facing today. The military spending has gone all time high to 1.6 trillion, with 25 million soldiers and 1,000 military bases around the world. And the impact of it on armed conflict is on the individual societies and economies huge. At the same time, we have 12.4 million people starving and dying in the whole of Africa. Besides, we are all also beset by financial and climate change crisis, which has put the planet in peril. The core message of the 4D campaign for the world peace is that threats of today are interlinked and interdependent. States, individuals, and civil society around the world need to work together in tandem to make progress on peace, human rights, wealth, and climate change issues for common good. These issues cannot be tackled by one single country or single organization, no matter how powerful it may be. 4D for World Peace is a mechanism to provide a central forum in which states can agree on norms to serve their common interest. It will analyze, educate, and advocate in the pursuit of agreed goals which are outlined in the 4D program. For launching this campaign, we'll be pleased to hear from you for consultation, for collaboration, and comments from individuals and organizations. Let me now talk about what we are going to do today, uh, or what event the United for Peace is hosting today. NGOs and civil society all over the world harvest and represent the wisdom of social movements, turning ideas into practice. We are here today to explore 
why some campaigns win and others fail. How some of the campaigns undertaken by the world's NGOs have become a reality and now are best policies, bills and charges in the world. Some examples are the landmine treaty, the formation of international criminal court, nuclear non-proliferation -prol treaty, and the list goes on. Recently, we have seen the civilian search for freedom and democracy happening around the uprising in the Middle East and North Africa, known as the Arab Spring, and actions against government of India <coughs> by the famous Indian anti-corruption <coughs> activist Anna Hazari, who inspired a wave of protests across the country. These are examples of citizen power, social activism, which persuades the, the policy makers to change direction. So let me move on to what is the formula for a successful campaign. Obviously have the end in mind, know what you want to achieve and why. Make your cause appealing and then practically hardly any marketing is required. I will outline three principles for a successful campaign. Number one, awareness or collective consciousness. Number two, the Far Indian principle. And then number three, the defining spirit of the age. For number one, to raise the awareness, I will quote Confucius, the 15th century Chinese philosopher. And he said, and I quote, Tell me, and I will forget. Show me, and I may remember. Involve me, and I will understand. So for raising awareness and collective consciousness, the focus should be on dialogue and involvement and involvement around three sets of people. Which are these sets? Ones who are converted to your cause. Second, the floaters who will go along with the tide. And third, who are not convinced or will not empathize with your cause. The quality of the campaigning leader organization is to keep the converted persuade the floater and spread awareness and reason with the ones who are not your own, own side. In other words, this can be done by motivation, harness, harnessing the peer pressure, making the undeliverable deliverable, changing the environment, rewarding the success. I move on to my second principle, which is Fire Engine principle. Follow the Fire Engine principle, which is all about harnessing the awareness and opportunity which is created by a fast moving metaphorical fire engine that figures the way in heavy traffic, eliminating any obstacles on the path to success. While keeping within law, if one can follow the newly opened track by the fire engine, there is an unparalleled competitive advantage because one can get across miles of perceived obstacles via this fast track technique. And the third one is the spirit of time. Every time, every age, every year, and every moment has a defining spirit. This time spirit is called Zeitgeist. <coughs> beautiful German word. Or <laughs> stand up at the how is it pronounced? <laughs> Zeitgeist. Zeitgeist. So, so I'm doing fine, yeah? <laughs> In order to be successful, one has to appreciate the zeitgeist and capture it in single words and sit in those critical words in meetings with key colleagues and pursue one's goals in enlight and enlightenment with the message. These, those magic words which define the message, if repeated at critical meetings, eventually propel the leader or the organization towards becoming unique and, and memory. In one of our favorite films, The Graduate, with Dustin Hoffman and Anne Bancroft, from 1967, directed by the extremely talented Mike Nichols, the young Benjamin is taken aside by his father's partner, who tells him that the key to success can be summarized in one word, plastics. 
The young Benjamin is simultaneously confused and amused by that single word. <laughs> that, that is a defining word or message of the late 60s. If that message would have to be changed today, it will be biogradable plus. Or in the 1990s, it would be interlinked. So, the bottom line is, stick to the fire engine principle, identify the spirit of the age, find out where the burning fire is, tame the fire, and carry on repeating that in, in that mantra and seminars, meetings, conferences. The key words for defining success are timing, drive, hard work, self-belief, innovation, vision, luck, fulfillment. And the formula to adopt is ethics, friendship, attention to detail, teamwork, persistence, collective evaluation, forgiveness and reward. When opportunity presents, deploy the fire engine principle. In conclusion, let me say that right to campaign is with us from when the Magna Carta, the great charter for the liberties of England was issued in the year 1215. The sacred text was guaranteed by the king after a campaign and a rebellion which resulted in the creation of the Magna Carta. It gave citizens a potent voice against injustice, oppression and wrongdoing. Whatever the big ideas can be for achieving world peace, nuclear disarmament, disposing a dictator, bringing development, promoting human rights, we will succeed only if the people we know and respect are with us. <coughs> Top-down exhortations from the state or large corporations do not work. All campaigners and practitioners combine theory and experience to make issues practical, relevant, effective. Let us find what is the defining spirit of the age, where the fire is burning. Act to tame the fire, spread the awareness and consciousness and become powerful agent, agents for change. Clement Attlee, the former British Prime Minister after the Second World War said, there will always be a peace movement within the Labour Party, but it will remain in minority. We are here today to challenge and bury his prophetic words and make the peace movement big, vibrant and forced to let him be. Thank you very much. I'm going to start with introducing the first speaker who is John Hillary, Executive Director of War and Want. <coughs> and people, just to say a few words about war and war, fights poverty in developing countries in partnership with people affected by globalization. They campaign for human rights and against the root causes of global poverty, inequality and injustice. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Hill. Thank you very much, PJ. It's a great pleasure to be here. I was getting a little worried as you were going on in your speech whether there was going to be anything left for us to sort of think about in terms of, uh, of what we had to offer in this discussion. Um, but it's a, great, it's a great pleasure for me to be here um, speaking tonight. War on Want, as many of you know, was founded 60 years ago in 1951 when Britain was in sort of similar straits to today slightly sort of um, low on cash, but also engaged in a similar ambition around the world of fighting wars, engaging in the arms trade, and actually not contributing as it should to world development. And the left-wing publisher, Victor Gallant, who saw this trend and was appalled by it in the years after the Second World War, he put a letter in The Guardian asking for people who agreed with him that there should be something done about this situation, simply to send him a postcard with one word on, which was yes. And over 10,000 people sent him this postcard in the space of the first month alone. And that led to the birth of War and Want as a movement. And the movement was always, right from the beginning, focused on the twin evils of, on the one side, militarism, 
and on the other side, underdevelopment. And that's why, for War on One, it's a particular pleasure to be able to support the 4Ds campaign, because the 4Ds campaign brings together exactly those same principles. Fighting against militarism, and at the same time fighting for development and democracy. So we're really, really pleased to be involved in that. And particularly, as Vijay said, the links between the two, which have become ever more apparent, I think, when you look at the geostrategic reasons for most of the wars that are being waged around the world, whether it be Afghanistan, or Libya, or Iraq, it's quite clear that the links between the geostrategic reasons and the economic reasons for being in these countries is, is, is well made. We can discuss that more maybe when it comes to um, the discussion next. But Vijay asked me in the, in the final six minutes that I have to speak, just to, sorry, Vijay asked me just to speak a little bit about War on Want's experience of campaigns over the years and some of the conclusions that we draw, both from our successes and from our not quite so successful moments. Um, I won't say failures, but the lessons we've learned along the way. And I think that the first thing is that irrespective of whatever you do, actually articulating the reasons, the rationale for why you're doing it is already an important thing. And the setting up of an organization of a campaign such as with the 4Ds booklet, I think is already a really good thing to have done. It begins to give the vision, the mission, and set out why the organization is going down this particular path. Um, certainly for War on One, one of the key things of this, and one of the key engagements with an international discourse on peace and development, is that you have to make clear that these are political choices. Poverty and war in the world are caused by political decisions made by elites. They can be government elites, they can be corporate elites. And the political solutions come from us. Vijay's already said that. The problems are political, the solutions are political. And that's really important at the moment, because more and more at the moment, you see many NGOs arguing that this is all now a technical issue. It's like a sort of technical battle against the disease, which everybody knows is there. We've just got to have enough research, and we can crack it. That is not the case when it comes to issues of international development and war and politics. It's all down to people's choices, and those choices we can have an influence over. So the first thing, then, this message, this creation of a discourse, is really important. But, having said that, it's really not enough. It's not, it's not sufficient just to have an organization which is there and feels very proud about how it talks about itself and doesn't do anything. So we know that the next thing has got to be about the campaigns it runs and the different partnerships it makes. And again, these can be at quite a sort of high level of goals that you want to try and meet. For example, the liberation of colonial peoples was one which was absolutely central in the years after the Second World War. And we are happy to say that by and large across the world that trend has been to the liberation of those peoples. And there remain obvious cases where you still have to fight for that. Apartheid South Africa was one of the most obvious ones and it took decades of a worldwide movement and struggle from within South Africa itself right in the lead of that to change that, to win the victory over apartheid. Today we still have Palestine struggling for its independence. We have Western Sahara under occupation by Morocco. But that overall goal remains, and economic justice would be another one, an end to militarism, what we at War want to call the business of war, would be another. But again, beneath those goals, you have to set up the specifics. In a sense, it's a little bit like the, the, the metaphor of how you eat an elephant, when you have to eat it bite by bite. And when you try and take on the whole thing at once, it's going to be pretty indigestible. That, I think, is the key thing about campaigns. Finding where you can have a specific impact towards that broader goal of what you're trying to achieve. And those winnable milestones, I think, are absolutely crucial. It, it sounds very obvious what you're doing, but we can often forget that. We can say, we are campaigning for an end to the arms trade. Well, fine, but... but what do you actually mean when you say it? We say we're campaigning for <coughs> Palestinian justice, but what do you mean when you're actually saying that? And that's why I thought just a couple of examples from War and Once 
um, history would be important here. I'm going to start with Palestine. We, we, we brought out um, just last November a new report, Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions, which is about specific practical ways in which people in this country can get involved in bits of the Palestinian issue. Because again, if you wanted to find an intractable issue, which has really meant that, that people can't see a way into it at all, people are not really used to the subject, just think, well, how can I possibly deal with something which has resisted any form of solution over so many years? You've got to give people practical ways in. And one of the things that we did is we looked at one of the companies which is most involved in supporting the illegal occupation of the West Bank and in Gaza, and particularly in the destruction of homes. And it was a company called Caterpillar, which produces all of the big bulldozers, militarized bulldozers, which the Israeli army uses. But it also produces hats, rucksacks, chunky boots, and shirts and things like that, which many people can buy in the high street. So it's a company that people know and recognize, particularly there you are know, students you'll find when you do a talk with students and ask them how many of you own Caterpillar boots, hats, things, a third of them will say yes. So immediately you've got that interaction. We brought out a, a, a study of exactly how Caterpillar's bulldozers were being used by the Israeli government to demolish Palestinian homes and to clear the way for the illegal separation wall which runs through the West Bank. And then various of the activists would take those into shoe shops. And they'd go into a shoe shop and they'd start putting on Caterpillar boots. And instead of walking around seeing how they fit, they'd then actually take out a copy of our report and start reading it to everybody in the shop. <laughs> and they couldn't be thrown out the shop because they were wearing 100 pounds worth of Caterpillar boots. <laughs> and, they had a and that type of creative activism began to build in momentum. We then went to the Church of England. The Church of England had £2.2 .2 million pounds of its investments in Caterpillar as a company. We went to the investment group which, which advises the Church of England on its investments. We went to the General Synod, which is the democratic body which directs the Church of England's work. And over a period of a couple of years, we met with people, we sensitized them, we said it's not really in keeping with the Church of England's ethical investment policy that you should have these investments in Caterpillar. The General Synod voted to remove them, and indeed, two years later, the Church of England withdrew its investments from Caterpillar. Each one of these small victories has added up to a situation now where the boycott divestment sanctions movement across the world is becoming stronger and stronger. And we know from people within Israel, it's the only thing which is driving the Israeli population as a whole to take note of what's going on in Palestine. So again, small victories, but all adding up as a movement as a whole in a, in a major step forward. And I think, again, I would echo what Vijay said. Always recognize that you're part of a movement. You're not doing this on your own. We all gather together in this broader movement for global justice. And part of a successful campaign is identifying what you can do that other people aren't. What role can you play in the movement? It's absolutely no use for all of us jumping on the same bandwagon and trying to push for the same thing. If, if Oxfam <coughs> got a campaign doing a particular thing, it's not really very good use of our resources to try and do the same thing unless we think they're going in the wrong direction. Also, and here's another example from War and history, looking at things where you can see important issues which aren't yet in the public domain, but which you feel are going to come up. In 1998, when the East Asian financial crisis had caused such horrific damage to the economies and to the people of countries like Indonesia, Thailand, South Korea, Orwan started a campaign for Tobin tax. Tobin tax, which at that time was very much focused on a small transaction tax on foreign currency, so that every time you would convert money from euro to the dollar to the yen to the pound, you'd have to pay a tiny, tiny proportion of, on, of your um, money towards a tax, which could then be used for issues such as <coughs> development or whatever. Thirteen years later, the European Commission has just announced that it is going to put in place a financial transactions tax. Thirteen years of hard graft of being told year after year after year that it was not feasible. It took about seven years to convince all the people that it is actually feasible. 
Then, another three or four years, and say, okay, maybe it is feasible, we still don't want it. We went to one of the people at the Treasury, and she said, it's a no and a no. It's a no because we don't believe you can do it. If you could do it, it's still a no. We got over the first no, but not in the uh, UK, and we got over the second no in France and Germany. So there's a possibility of that. There's still an argument with Sarkozy, though. There's still arguments which are there, but there's still you know, an enormous step forward. But this, the last, last thing I was going to say, I had a couple of other examples, but I've, I've been told that's my time. The last thing I was going to say is whatever you do, whatever you do in terms of the impact and the outcomes in the real world, and we need to be focused on what we can achieve and what we can change in the room. The other pillar of a successful campaign has got to be the movement of people you build around. And that, I think, is why it's absolutely right that VJ said involvement, engagement of as many people as possible is just as important as the outcomes. Because that builds the sustainability for the next part of the movement and the next part of the campaign. So you must see it as not just a one-off thing where you, you know, wrap up and everybody goes home and that's the end of it. It must be an organic, growing movement. And that, I think, we can build together. And that's why I'm really happy that Bora wants involved with this campaign. Thank you. Thanks, uh, John, Hillary, and well done. And we'll have more time in the question answer session. So all the speakers will have more time. Our second speaker today is Jeremy Gilly. Jeremy Gilly is an English actor, filmmaker, and founder of the charity Peace Wendy. He was instrumental in persuading the United Nations to declare the 21st September the International Day of Peace and probably and he's done a very successful 21st uh, September Peace Day this year. And probably he's going to speak about films, campaigning, and world peace, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeremy Gill. Um, well, thank you very much. Don't know where you were. Well, given I'm a filmmaker, I'm going to show a film. Um, it probably seems the best thing to do. Um, countries, if we want the world leaders, if we want the member states of the United Nations who voted unanimously for this day of peace, if we want them to observe it, then we the people are going to have to act and become involved. And if we become involved, they will follow. But they won't do it if we don't do it. On 21st September, there should be no violence. No conflict, no fighting at every level of society for at least a day. The time is now. Please act on the 21st of September 2012. Please be a part of this global truce. Thank you. So look, um, so you've seen a film there, um, that, that's a long journey, uh, 1998, it's wonderful to see the Brahma Kumaris here, because right when I began this journey, Danny Jenki was one of the first people that I saw, and it's amazing, I mean, I've, it's amazing when I, when I went to see her, and I was you know, very young, well, younger, and very enthusiastic, and you know, everybody that I met was an opportunity, I felt, to maybe get some financial support, or some kind of support that would help us on our journey to try and create the first ever day of peace with a fixed calendar date, which you now know, of course, is the 21st of September. And I remember being really enthusiastic in front of her, and, you know, kind of obviously very naive, and asking her all of these questions. And I remember her taking a deep breath and looking at me, and she said, Jeremy, it's already happened. All you've got to do is breathe. And it was just the most amazing thing for anybody to say, so deeply, incredibly profound, that somebody could say it's already happened and all you've got to do is breathe. And she was completely right. It, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful, isn't it, this process that we're all on. You know, we just have to keep trying and keep working and not being fixated on the result, whatever it may be. And certainly as a filmmaker, that certainly helped me. You know, when we try to create the first ever day of peace with a fixed calendar date, or we tried to go in Afghanistan to see if we could get the Taliban to stop fighting, which everybody, of course, said was impossible. We weren't concerned about whether we did those things. We were just interested in documenting 
Because whether we fail or succeed in terms of the processes that we're all involved in in this room is frankly irrelevant because it's for other generations to learn from our mistakes and our successes. And through that learning, obviously, becomes change and hope and, and a future that I hope we can all live in. And I totally believe that peace is possible. I believe there is a fundamental shift going on. I believe that we can move from a culture of war to a culture of peace. I believe the sort of level of consciousness around the fundamental issues that humanity faces is changing. And in the very short period of time, that I've been involved in the peace process over the last 12 years, it is getting easier, not more difficult. There's no question. And there are great changes that are going on in terms of the way the corporate sector is behaving. And if you look at the Global Peace Index, which is an extraordinary index, where the corporate sector knows that in order to do good business, there has to be peace. And that investment that's coming from the corporate sector is incredibly interesting. That if the corporate world knows it can make money from peace, then we've got a great, idea, great opportunity for peace to prevail. And those kinds of things excite, excite me and keep us going. Well, we, we did have a good one. Would you, like to, one more, please. you tell me when to stop, because I could, you know, <laughs> why just keep on going. Well, one, 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 one or two minutes. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. What I'll basically say is we did launch a good campaign last week, Global Truths 2012. There is a lot of information on the website, uh, peaceoneday.org. And as the film said, it's going for the largest reduction of violence, 21st of September 2012 and the largest gathering of human beings in the name of peace and sustainability. And the signs are incredibly encouraging from all sectors of society. I mean, it's some really wonderful, exciting conversations. I hope you as peace campaigners will join in on that. Please find out more about peaceoneday.org. It's not about us. It's just about us documenting a lot of people coming together. So um, you know, I look forward to working with you and having the opportunity to meet in one day. But thank you very much, and I wish the 4D campaign the very best of luck. Thank you.